Hi and welcome to History Legends. Today we'll do a step-by-step -step breakdown of Simple's history. Why did the British attack the French allies during World War II? I'll give you my thoughts as we go along this video. Honestly, I'm pretty excited because events like the attack on Marcel Kebir truly fascinate me. Although it happened over 80 years ago, we can still debate about it for hours. Without further ado, let's go. When the British attacked their French allies on purpose, the attack on Mirz el Kabir, July 3, 1940. On June 22, 1940, France signed an armistice with Germany, thus effectively ending their participation in the conflict. The French Third Republic ceased to exist. Oh, nice, nice. I like how they said that it's the French Third Republic that collapsed. Because when we think about it, France stayed in the conflict in one shape or another from the very beginning until the end now occupied by the Germans. The unoccupied part of France, the territory in the south of the country, and the colonial empire was put under the control of the French state. The new state, run by the government in Vichy, took a neutral stand in the war, but was to be monitored from Germany. <laughs> this and you can imagine that the but monitored by Germany was the root of the problem with Britain. This newly established French neutrality posed a major problem for their former allies, Great Britain. Yeah, partly because the French were never supposed to even sign an armistice with Germany without Britain knowing. But that's another story. The French fleet, which was still intact, was seen as a serious threat, especially if the Axis forces managed to commandeer it and use it against them. Bef yes, but I don't know if I want to go too much in depth about this topic, but... Many historians claim that even if the Germans got hold of the French Navy, they didn't have the sailors, neither did Italy did have enough sailors to actually commandeer it and use it to its full capacity. But that's another story. Before World War II, the French Marine Nationale underwent a process of modernization by building new improved classes of destroyers and battleships. In 1940, the French Navy was among the most powerful navies in the world, along with those of Great Britain, the United States, Japan, and Italy. Okay, honestly, I got a bit confused with the ranking. So I had to look it up online. And here is what it said about the top six most powerful navies at the beginning of World War II. So at number one, you have the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. Number two, you have the United States. Number three, you have Japan. Number four, you have France. Number five, Italy. And only at number six, Germany. Right off the bat, I think the video is already very nice and is a bit glorifying the French Navy at the time. But let's be honest, in 1940, the French Navy was a paper tiger. Most of their battleships were too lightly armored. They had trouble to stay at sea for a long time. And overall, they were equipped with mediocre artillery. So yes, it looked good on parade, but for operational use, that's another story. Now, if these technical problems were not enough, French ships did not have sonars, which the Royal Navy already used since 1923. They did not have radars and basically lacked the most basic anti-aircraft capabilities. It was the perfect World War I Navy. Now, the problem is that both the British and the French underestimated the importance of aircraft carriers and were still focused on the ships with the big guns. Its main task was the protection of the routes between metropolitan France and its colonies. Mm -hmm. With the war approaching, Admiral Francois Galland, commander-in-chief of the Navy, anticipated that the majority of the fleet would be engaged in the Mediterranean theater mm -hmm. against the Italian Regia Marina. When, on May 10, 1940, Germany attacked France, there was little the French Navy could do about it. It was the Army and the Air Force that took the brunt of the onslaught from the invading German forces. Yes, that's true. In the six weeks of the Battle of France, the French Army lost 60,000 killed, or roughly 1,400 per day. And in comparison, during the 40-week-long Battle of Verdun, which cost the French army 160,000 killed, which can translate at an average of 570 killed per day. This goes to show how ferocious the fighting was in the summer of 1940. 
When Italy entered the war on June 10th, did Admiral Darlan order his ships to attack industrial installations along the Italian coast? Until June 22nd and the signing of the armistice, there had been no significant clashes between the French and the Italian Mediterranean fleets. Under the conditions of the armistice, the French state was allowed to keep its entire navy, but under certain conditions, like the rest of the armed forces, to keep it neutral in any further conflicts, ships were to be... It's funny, the Germans imposed similar sanctions to the French in 1940, as the French sanctioned the Germans in 1918. Anchored in metropolitan and colonial ports, the majority of the navy went along with the conditions of the armistice and sided with the Vichy government. Several ships, however, were placed under British custody. These were ships that had taken shelter in the English ports of Plymouth and... So like the video mentioned, the Navy was under command of Admiral Darlan. He was very proud of the Navy he had built. Problem is, Darlan and many French officials did not understand the scope of the war to come. He thought this would be the end of this war and that they could fight another day. Another problem was that Darlan was known for being anti-English. In December 1939, French and British naval officers had a gathering and Darlan responded to a toast in his honor by talking about his ancestor killed by the British at Trafalgar. Not the best way to bond with your allies. Darlan, above all, was an opportunist with little convictions. He wanted to keep fighting in 1940 and when Pétain went to talk to him in private, he quickly changed his mind and joined Vichy because that would give him a higher position in the hierarchy. But then in 1942, when he saw the Vichy regime starting to crumble, he quickly changed side and talked with the Americans. Several ships, however, were placed under British custody. These were ships that had taken shelter in the English ports of Plymouth and Portsmouth and Alexandria in Egypt. I think some of these ships were in British custody after the Dunkirk evacuation, but correct me if I'm wrong before the armistice was signed. These ships remained under the command of their French commanders who were loyal to the Vichy, but who were restrained from any combat activity. Oh, that's interesting. Overall, it's not only Darlan, but the entire French Navy that was quite hostile to the British. As some of you know, the French Navy is commonly named La Royale, the Royal, and their number one enemy throughout centuries was the British Royal Navy. For many of them, they would rather not fight and be neutral than to fight under a British banner. Yeah, so that was the mentality of the people at the time, completely outdated. Despite the open antagonism shown by the Vichy oh, government see. to them, the British were not overly concerned that they would actually violate the terms of the armistice. But what they did fear was, what if the German military commandeered the whole French fleet and combined it with their own to you? Honestly, that's a legitimate fear. It was against them. This was, despite assurances from the French that they would scuttle the fleet if such a thing happened. The British War Cabinet preferred not to leave anything to chance. If the Germans did manage to get their hands on the French fleet, the British would lose supremacy in the Mediterranean, and subsequently North Africa and the Middle East. Therefore, the British decided to deal with the French ships themselves. They instigated Operation Catapult with the intention to either seize or neutralize as much of the French Navy as they could. Now you, let me know in the comment section what you would have done if you had been in the shoes of Churchill. Now, again, this video is very nice towards the French, but there's an important detail that's missing. The British have tried to talk some sense to the French for all of June 1940 regarding the French Navy. So yes, Darlan had promised that the Navy would never fall into German hands. But could Churchill actually trust the French? The French had promised not to sign a separate peace with the Germans. Promise not kept. They had promised to send the 400 captured German pilots to Britain. Promise not kept. And they promised that they would warn the British before considering peace talks with the Germans. Again, promise not kept. Rightfully, Churchill panicked. And as a strategist, he envisioned the worst possible scenario. And that's how, in the heat of the moment, in mid-June 1940, he planned the attack of the French fleet stationed at Mercel Kébir. The fleet in the Mediterranean was stationed in the port of Toulon in France and several ports in Algeria. 
The naval base in Toulon was heavily protected and thus presented a bigger challenge than the Algerian ones. For that reason, the port of Merz el Kabir near Oran was picked as a target. It was also very close to the naval base in Gibraltar. That, that was British. To eliminate any potential threat coming from the French fleet, the British assembled their fleet in Gibraltar, yes, designated Force H. Its commander, Vice Admiral Sir James Somerville, received an order to present the French Admiral Marcel Bruno Gensoul in Mers el Kabir with an ultimatum to hand over the fleet under his command. The alternative plan was to attack the fleet and neutralize it. So that part is pretty well explained and that makes me happy. But keep in mind that the bulk of French naval forces had already departed mainland France. On this map, you can see the location of all the French vessels stationed around the world. Most were in British custody or stationed in French colonies in Africa. Somerville disapproved of such an approach, but the cabinet and especially Winston Churchill insisted that he carry out the order without delay. On July 3rd, 1940, ships of Force H approached the coast of Algeria. The crazy thing is that only two or three weeks before that, the French and the British were still solid allies. So you can understand how a lot of French people felt betrayed by the British attack. But then again, the British also felt betrayed by the French signing the armistice. HMS Foxhound carrying Captain C.S. Holland, the officer tasked with delivering the ultimatum, continued toward Merz el Kabir. Okay, Holland, there's something very important about him. Captain Cedric Holland was sent specifically because he used to be a British naval attaché in Paris. He spoke French, he liked the French, and he proudly wore his Légion d'honneur, the highest French order of merit. Basically, Somerville tried to really be nice to the French and avoid any confrontation. Since the HMS Foxhound entering the port would be a violation of the armistice, Admiral Gensoul refused to let it in. Instead, Captain Holland embarked on a motorboat and headed into the harbor. Offended that Admiral Somerville was only sending a captain as his emissary, Jassou refused to meet him and sent his flag lieutenant instead. And honestly, you would be surprised at how many times negotiations failed because of silly stuff like that. You see, the French Admiral Jansou was an idiot. He absolutely didn't understand that the British specifically sent a Francophile just to negotiate with him. But this imbecile of Jean Soul took it as an insult. And just to let you know how much his memory has been like almost completely forgotten, if you look him up online, there's barely anything mentioned after the event of Marcel Kibir. This man literally just disappeared after that. Good. Captain Holland delivered the British ultimatum. The French were offered five options. One, sail with the British and continue the fight against Germany and Italy. Yeah. Two, sail to a British port with reduced crews where the ships would be safeguarded until hostilities were over. Also good. Three, sail with reduced crews to a French West Indies port where the ships could be demilitarized or entrusted to the safekeeping of the United States. Also good. Four, sink all ships within six hours less good five face the use of whatever force may be necessary option to prevent the french fleet from falling into german or italian hands worst scenario at 10 hundred hours admiral Gensoul delivered his reply i personally believe the british were very lenient and patient with the french and honestly Gensoul had so many options to choose from like you just saw you know, the British could have gone Japanese and just attack right away without any warning to eliminate the threat. At the same time, the only thing we can say about Jean Soule is that he was a soldier and he was asked to take political decisions that were out of his scope. Repeating assurances that the French fleet would never enter the war on the German side. At the same time, he warned that his ships would retaliate if the British attacked them. By that time, Force H had appeared on the horizon, waiting for Captain Holland to return with the news. Yeah, because they couldn't attack while he was still in the French ships, so they actually patiently waited for him to come back to attack right away. After almost an entire day of negotiations, Holland left the harbor at 17.25 hours. Okay, there's something extremely important that has been left out. So it's true that Holland tried to negotiate with the French for hours. 
Now, the reason why it took so long is because Admiral Jean Soule purposely stalled the negotiations and sent a secret message to the French fleet stationed in Toulon to come rescue him and basically flank the British. But obviously, the British intercepted that message and immediately prepared for battle. At the same time, Somerville ordered his fleet to assume their bombardment stations. British Force H consisted of the battle cruiser HMS Hood, two battleships HMS Resolution and HMS Valiant, the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers. The French Force de Ré in Mersel Kabir comprised four battleships, Strasbourg, Dunkirk, Provence, and Bretagne, several destroyers, two torpedo boats, and the seaplane carrier the Commandant Tess. It was clear that the British had the advantage of the open sea. They were able to maneuver freely while the French ships were confined in the harbor with their bows facing the shore. Yeah, it's like an execution at this point. Moreover, the French ships were already in the process of demobilizing, and most of the sailors were ashore. And most... Okay, it's even worse than I thought. And so was simply not ready to fight. Before Somerville ordered his forces to open fire, six fairy swordfish escorted by three Blackburn Skua aircraft from HMS Ark Royal dropped magnetic mines at the harbor entrance to prevent the French ships from escaping. At 1754 hours, guns from... Knowing all this, we can't even understand why Jean Soule even attempted a battle. But of course, if you know that he was expecting reinforcements, then it makes more sense. HMS Resolution and HMS Valiant fired the first shots. Stunned that the British ships were actually firing at him, Jensoul ordered his fleet to return fire. His plan now was to leave the harbor as quickly as possible and form a battle line to confront the British in the open sea. Okay, he's really dumb, like, he has a numerical disadvantage, not even full crews, and he thinks he can win against, against the Royal Navy, just like that. Ridiculous. It was quite a difficult task with shells constantly raining down from the British ships. The first ship to be hit was the battleship Breton, whose stern was hit by a round from a British salvo. It caused a devastating explosion that sent metal debris along with the bodies of sailors high into the air. Within moments, the ship burst into flames. The second... I think that the Breton was the only ship that really sank like fully, fully destroyed. And with it, I think it's about 900 sailors that died because the ship sank within a few minutes. And to be hit was the large destroyer Mogador. As it was steaming towards the harbor exit, its bow was blown away by a shell that detonated the destroyer's depth charges. Unable to continue, Mogador anchored in shallow waters. After the initial shock, the French finally responded by opening fire. First from Provence, and then from Dunkirk. The latter fired only 40 rounds before a British round hit its boiler room, disrupting its electrical distribution system. This significant damage impaired the ship's performance, and its commander had no option but to run the ship ashore. While Provence waited for Dunkirk to get out of the way, it too was hit. Another thing I feel when I, I look at that is that most of these sailors, only a few weeks before, were prepared and trained to fight against either the Germans or the Italians. And now, all of a sudden, they have to face their old allies of the mighty Royal Navy. Round opened a gap in its hull, letting water in. Out of four battleships, only Strasbourg was still operational after the initial 10 minutes of shelling. What? Only 10 minutes of shelling? I thought the battle lasted for hours. But the other thing is, how did the British miss that ship? It was an execution, <laughs> and they missed. Astonishment of the British, it emerged from the harbor followed by four large destroyers. None of them were struck by the mines that the British had dropped at the harbor. Entrance. Oh my god. 15 minutes after the attack had started, at 1809 hours, Strasbourg left the harbor and turned northeast. At <laughs> what? Oh my god. He escaped! <laughs> oh my god, I, I completely forgot that some of the French ships actually managed to escape. You gotta give credit to the commander of the Strasbourg. He was lucky to avoid the massacre in the port, but then 
He maneuvered around the minefield and just made a run for it. But what a poor battle performance for Somerville. I'm not a naval expert, but it's not even me making this up. Somerville admitted to his wife in private that he had not been quite as aggressive in the destruction of the French fleet as he could have been. He had the numbers, the surprise effect, and he was attacking a fleet that was at half strength and stationary. And actually, Marcel Kibir, and I think another event later on, put Somerville into disgrace. And he would have stayed in disgrace had he not been able to destroy the German Bismarck. Before hours, Somerville reacted by ordering his light cruisers and destroyers to follow in pursuit. The two battleships HMS Resolution and HMS Valiant remained at Merzel Kabir. The pursuit was pointless though, as Strasbourg was already 18 miles ahead of them. At 2020. Yeah, that's one thing. The only thing that French ships were good at. These were perfect for hit and run attacks, and this is why the British were kind of paranoid. Imagine these ships attacking British trade routes or whatever. It could have been a, a nightmare. In five hours, Somerville broke off the pursuit as the Strasbourg was too far away and, more importantly, had been joined by destroyers and motorboats from Oran and cruisers from Algiers. One word of the attack on Merzel Kabir had reached... So they mentioned that the fleet from Algiers was coming to rescue, but I even think that the fleet in Toulon was also warned about this attack. But correct me if I'm wrong. Attack on Merzel Kabir had reached these two ports. Ships stationed there had left them in a great hurry, fearing that the British might attack them as well. At 2155 hours, Somerville ordered one last attack by ferry swordfish aircraft armed with torpedoes. The attack on Merzel Kabir was not the Okay, so if I understand properly, the attack of the swordfish failed. I was going to roast the swordfish for being biplanes, but I remembered how they spanked the Regia Marina at Taranto in October 1940 and how they helped in sinking the Bismarck. Only one conducted that day. On the morning of July 3rd, the British Royal Navy stormed French vessels stationed in Plymouth, Portsmouth and Alexandria. In English ports, they took control of two old battleships, two large destroyers and two fleet destroyers, seven submarines and 44 other vessels. The success came at the cost of the lives of two Royal Navy officers and one French sailor. In Alexandria, Vice Admiral René Godfroy, in command of one battleship, four cruisers, three destroyers and one submarine, decided not to resist the British. In return for letting him continue to command his fleet, Godfroy agreed to reduce the crews on board his ships, empty their fuel tanks and remove the guns breech blocks and deposit them at the French consulate. At least um, this uh, French admiral was smarter than Jean Soul, and overall things went more according to the plan for all the ships that were already in British custody. But there's an interesting thing, so when given the choice, barely any of these French sailors joined the embryonic Free French Forces, most asked to be shipped back to France. Again, these sailors and their commanders had a very poor understanding of the world war that was actually taking place. The outcome of the Merzel Kabir attack was tragic, to say the least, including the additional attack on Dunkirk on July 8th. The French lost 1,648 men. Okay, so this time uh, the swordfish actually proved to be very useful. Interesting. Of which 1,297 were killed. It was a heavy loss of life for a relatively small... And the swordfish proved to be particularly dangerous because, like we mentioned before, the French ships had barely any anti-aircraft capabilities. They were like walking targets. So this is why, yes, they could have been a threat maybe in the early stages of the war, but in the long run, I think they, they were more vulnerable than anything. Result. The Force Maritimes Francaise, the navy of the Vichy French, still remained a force to be reckoned with. When, in November 1942, the Germans conducted Operation Anton, military occupation of Vichy France, the French kept their word and scuttled the entire fleet in Toulon. Germans never managed to get a hold of the mighty French navy. French officers and sailors had honored the old alliance, despite the tragic outcome of the Merzel Kabir attack. Wow, they, they actually mentioned it. I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm actually happy that they mentioned how the Vichy French actually kept the word. 
and that the French, the Vichy French Navy never fell into German hands. But again, that was one of many broken promises. Now, this is a tragic event, but even de Gaulle said he would have done the same thing had he been in Churchill's shoes. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Let me know if I missed anything in the comment section below. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And if you want to help me create more content, consider joining my Patreon. Link in the description box.